thank you again for rejoining us for the second day of the 24th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium. Uh, I'm still Bob Keiter, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment, and we're just uh, thrilled uh, to have you with us uh, for these two days on this very important uh, topic of recreation challenges on public lands. Uh, we have an exciting uh, second uh, half day of the symposium ahead of us. Uh, as we uh, move into that, let me take a moment to once again extend our heartfelt thanks to our principal funders, the R. Harold Burton uh, Foundation, uh, which has been a founding donor of the symp uh, symposium since its inception in 1996, uh, to the Cultural Vision Fund, uh, which uh, both supports the symposium and our Young Scholar Program, our lecture series, and other Stegner Center programs. Uh, we also uh, have uh, sponsor funding uh, this year from the S.J. and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the Student Natural Resources Law Forum. Uh, as uh, you know from behind me and from yesterday, we'll use the Slido technology for questions uh, that uh, we'll pose uh, to our speakers uh, at the conclusion either of their individual talk or uh, conclusion of the panel. Um, with that, uh, I think uh, it's uh, appropriate to just uh, get underway, and it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker this morning, uh, Whit Fosberg, uh, who is the president and the CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, uh, an organization that he'll tell us about uh, that is focused on the uh, interests of the uh, hunting and angling uh, community. Uh, Whit, thank you for coming from Washington, D.C. and being with us here in the Intermountain West. All right, Bob, uh, everybody else, thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's a real honor. It was great to see Sally Jewell. Uh, and uh, so many others, friends, and meet new ones. Um, I am the president and CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. We're a coalition of about 58 different NGOs, ranging from the traditional hunting and fishing community, Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, Mule Deer Foundation, to uh, AFL-CIO, because 70% of their 12 million members hunt and fish. Outdoor Industry Association is one of our partners, Hispanic Access Foundation. We're trying to create that big tent for folks who care about hunting and fishing and conservation, and a lot of our focus is on public lands. Um, we'll get right into this. There are plenty of challenges in terms of hunting and fishing on public lands, but a little bit of history, which will be elementary to some of the folks here, but for others, maybe sort of illuminating to how hunting and fishing grew up with this conservation movement in this country. We think about the beginning of the conservation movement in America, and we really go back to the Theodore Roosevelt era of the 1800s, and largely folks like Roosevelt and George Bird Grinnell and others coming together at first to stop the market hunting. Uh, that is a pile of buffalo skulls up in Detroit in a warehouse. Uh, then we have some obviously upland bird shooting. I've seen some shoots today that don't look dissimilar to that. But in those days, it wasn't for sport. It was for you know, commercial uh, commerce. So Roosevelt and others recognized what they needed to do was to get the do something about this, and the sportsmen were the obvious people that had the most to lose if we lost the game in this country. So Roosevelt you know, created the public land system when he was president, set aside 230 million acres. And he didn't just do it for fish and wildlife. He did it, as folks have noted here, because he wanted America to be different than a lot of Europe and other places in the world where he wanted everybody to have the opportunity that he had had when his mother and his wife had died on the same day and he had then gone to North Dakota to try to find himself and to grieve and to uh, recollect his wits. And he wanted everybody to have that ability to get out there and test themselves in nature, not just against animals, but it could be hiking. And that is really the, the marriage we have with the recreation community today, is maintain those abilities that all of us have to get out there and practice the things we love, and they may do, do it in different ways, but it's something unique about this country. Beginning in the early 1900s, early beginning in 1887 with Boone and Crockett Club, really created the sportsmen in this country organized in really the first conservation you know, groups, a lot of them around. 
Boone and Crockett Wildlife Management Institute, Isaac Walton League Wildlife Society, National Wildlife Federation, then in 1937, Ducks Unlimited. And that really marked a change from groups that cared about conservation and fish and wildlife broadly to the beginning of the species groups. And today with the Trout Unlimited, the Elk Foundation, Turkey Federation, there are hundreds of species groups out there that have done remarkable things to bring back those species. We were created to try to get that focus back on the big picture and federal policy and what it basically underlies for everything we do if you love to hunt and fish or recreate on public lands in this country. All of this evolved in what we now call the, now the North American model of wildlife conservation. There are seven sisters. There's the main tenets to that that I'm not going to get into, but here are some of the key points. Fish and game belong to everyone. They don't belong to the landowner. They don't belong to the government. They don't belong to the corporation. They belong to all of you. And also there's the, what we call the democracy of hunting and fishing. You don't have to be rich and be the landed gentry as you do in much of Europe to get out and do this stuff. It doesn't matter whether you're a Wall Street magnate or a you know, line worker at a factory, you know, this is something you can do and that is uniquely American. We also have about 640 million acres of public lands that we can go out and do this on, which then makes it much more open and accessible to the public as opposed to the pay to play situations we have in much of Europe. And then finally, we created a mechanism where sportsmen pay for professional management. And think about this, in 1936, during the height of the depression, sportsmen asked for an excise tax to be added on to guns, ammunition, then archery equipment and others, because they could see what was happening in this country with declining wildlife resources. They knew that if they weren't able to step up, that we're gonna lose all of this. At that time, you know, there was serious consideration a bunch of the waterfowl species going extinct. Black bear were basically gone. Elk numbers in the West were a fraction of what they are today. Buffalo clearly was essentially gone at that point. You know, white-tailed deer in the East were rare. Today, white-tailed deer in the East are not rare. We'll just leave it at that. And then also in the 1930s, we passed the Duck Stamp Act. So anybody who wanted to waterfowl hunt went and bought a permit you know, to allow them to do that. That money went straight into buying habitat, wetlands, to preserve and expand and to restore wetlands, this whole process. The excise tax got expended, extended to fishing equipment in the 1950s with the Dingle Johnson program. Pittman Robertson was the hunting side of it. It's been amended a few different times, but today motorboat fuel, fishing equipment, guns, ammo, archery equipment, all get a 10 or 11% excise tax that goes to the federal government that is passed back out to the states to pay for professional management and habitat restoration and access. Uh, also, sportsmen, to go out and do this stuff, you have to buy a license. That pays for you know, the, you know, the right to do it and pays for the fishing game and the enforcement in the state agencies. Somewhere between 60 and 80% of state agencies' budgets are paid for directly with sportsmen's dollars today. And those agencies also have primary jurisdiction of managing wildlife on public lands. All right, so economics. You know, hunting and fishing is a big business. Some were about 49 million Americans hunt and fish. Um, today, 11, point, you know, 11 and a half million Americans hunt. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about those trends because those trends are going the wrong direction. Fishing is actually increasing right now. Combined expenditure is about $61 billion and about 483,000 direct jobs through the hunting and fishing community. Put that in perspective, about 180,000 people are employed in the oil and gas industries. In the West, 72% of all hunting happens on public lands. All right, so this is a chart on uh, hunting license sales. It's actually not quite updated. If you push it through 2016, which is the last five-year survey by the Fish and Wildlife Service, 11.5 million people hunt. Five years earlier, in 2011, it was 13.7 million. So the trends are going the wrong direction in a big hurry. There are a lot of things that are contributing to that, the hunter education process, the difficulty of getting licenses. But if you ask hunters why they stop hunting, the top two answers are loss of access and don't have the time to do it anymore. Now, obviously, those two are related. If you lose close by access and it takes further to get someplace, it becomes a time issue as well. Perversely, this also crowds you know, a lot of the access at places that, so people think there are more hunters. So you hear a common complaint about the hunting community. It's like, I don't see any decline. There are more people than ever in the woods that I hunt. And it may well be true, just because we've lost so much access in other places, it's being pushed into certain spots, and that's where we have conflicts arise. All right, so we're gonna talk about access. We're gonna talk about development. Development is pretty obvious. It doesn't really matter if you can access a place to hunt and fish if there's no game there and it's been industrialized. 
And then I'm going to talk a little bit about climate, which is the sort of 800-pound gorilla in the room that's going to affect hunting and fishing on public lands for a very long time. All right, so access. The, uh, there are a few different things going on here. I mean, the loss of access is, you know, it depends on where you are. It is different you know, how you manifest that. In D.C., where I live, we have a guy that works in our office, an older guy. He talks about hunting quail in McLean, Virginia, which is 10 miles outside D.C. when he was growing up. There are no quail in McLean, Virginia anymore, and if you walk around the street with a shotgun, you're going to go to jail. So you have this sort of growing you know, encroachment of sprawl across the country. You obviously see it here, you see it other places, and it makes it just harder and harder to get outside. Um, and then it also does what we talk about, you know, packing in access at traditional spots. Plus, in the West, in the old days, you could pretty much knock on anybody's door, cross the public lands, cross the private lands to get that national forest behind. Think about how the public lands were developed, or private lands, the public lands in the West. You know, the good arable lands along the river bottoms, that's private land. Everything else, the mountains, the arid lands without water, that's the public lands. But a knock on the door, maybe an elk stake, got you across that, you know, private lands to the public lands. As a lot of those lands have changed hands, either been subdivided or some rich Californian buys it, the first thing that happens is no trespassing sign gets put up, and, uh, you know, traditional access maybe not legal access, but traditional access is lost. So, what we, uh, so the, the problem is you know, a pretty profound problem right now. It's made worse by the fact that we did a report you know, with Onyx Maps, which is a handheld GPS mapping company this summer, and uh, to really look at landlocked public lands, those lands that belong to all of us, but you can't get to because they're completely surrounded by private lands. So two types we talked about here. I mean, here's one example, you know, wholly enclosed by public lands. This is the Buffalo Field Office in Wyoming. Um, you know, about 6,000 acres of that big block right there. No legal access whatsoever. And then uh, here's another one. We have the checkerboard patterns, which are around much of the West. It is illegal in most of the states to corner hop. So in theory, you think that you go from one corner and step into the next corner, you'd be okay. The way that's been interpreted is the airspace above that is private land, and therefore you can't corner hop. So you have situations like this, where there's a lot of public land out there interspersed with private land, but essentially, it all is private, essentially it's all private land because of the inability to get to those public parcels. In total, the report we did with Onyx documented 9.52 million acres in the West are off limits to public access, have no legal access rights across those lands. Wyoming is by far the worst defender. Actually, Utah is not too bad. Uh, Montana is bad, and uh, this sort of points out the problem we have here, but also points out a solution, which is if we can do a better job of accessing those lands, we create a whole bunch more hunting and fishing habitat than we have right now. We decrease conflict, we decrease pressure. Here's a, it's not just a BLM problem, about 93% of the acres that we documented in this report with Onyx are on BLM lands. Forest Service is a problem too. I mean, here's a case in the Boise National Forest where you're less about 200 yards from a legal road there's the national forest that can't be accessed because it's completely surrounded by private lands. You'd think that if we targeted some access projects on those little places, we could probably get a lot of access out of it. You know, here's some of the checkerboard patterns. This is Forest Service wilderness in the East Humboldt Mountains that is completely inaccessible for, to, uh, public land or for the, to the public. Uh, Montana, this is Region 7, which is basically western, I mean, excuse me, southeastern Montana. All those little red spots, that equals about almost 900,000 acres of BLM lands that's inaccessible to the public. In total, in this area, there are about four, almost 4 million acres that are federally owned by BLM, about a quarter of those inaccessible. Uh, here's a project that actually was used to open this up. This is on the uh, tributary of the John Day River in Oregon, a spectacular country. Uh, the uh, Western Rivers Conservancy purchased two ranches, which not only, you know, sort of opened up about 2,500 acres of private land, public land that had been completely landlocked before, but then also opened up access to 75,000 acres of public land beyond that that was really hard to access, not technically landlocked, but really difficult to access. We talked about yesterday the crowding in places like Moab and all these sort of hidden jewels around that get almost no visitation. I mean, this is the land we're talking about along the John Day. It is a spectacular, it's a great steelhead fishery, great smallmouth bass fishery, and uh, is probably about the least visited unit in the entire system. 
All right, then there's another side of the whole access issue, which is land disposal. Now, we all remember Jason Chaffetz here and uh, his bill, H.R. 621, which would have sold off 3.3 million acres of public lands to help balance the budget and the backlash that he incurred because of that bill. Now, a few years before he introduced that, the threat of selling off public lands was gaining more steam, coming out as pretty much all bad ideas involving public lands do from the state of Utah. And uh, yeah, so we created a website called, you know, that sportsisaccess.org was in that lower left-hand site. So we'd been ginning up pressure, creating, getting signatures, getting activists for about two plus years before basically Mono from Heaven came and Chaffetz introduced his bill. And these guys descended on him like a plague of locusts, basically. And uh, he was very quick to take to, you know, Instagram and withdraw his bill and then retire from Congress that shortly thereafter. So, I mean, the, the outright threat of selling off public lands, I don't think is nearly as severe as it was five years ago. But we have a much more insidious you know, problem here. Uh, we have all these various areas out there that are slated for disposal, legally, uh, that really should not be. And Chaffetz, and I don't give Chaffetz a lot of credit in general, but he's right on this case. These were all areas he had talked about selling off that had been identified by BLM as suitable for disposal. Now, did, BLM didn't do that because it's evil. As part of FLIPMO, the Organic Act for BLM, the agency has to, when it's doing the RMP revisions, identify lands that are suitable for disposal. And those may be isolated, hard to manage, you know, areas that just don't make big sense. It may be something within the Las Vegas city limits that, frankly, BLM is far better off trading and getting something else. But uh, the problem is that as BLM looks at disposal criteria for public lands, recreation and access are not things it's allowed to look at until yesterday. So SO3373 is a secretary order that Dave Bernhardt signed yesterday that changes the disposal criteria for BLM lands to now include access and recreation. And if any parcel is important for rec recreation or access, it's taken off that list. Here is one such parcel. So this is a BLM you know, parcel in the Buffalo uh, unit, and uh, it, joins, it joins the Bighorn National Forest. There is a hiking trail that goes right through this isolated section of BLM lands, which is only 729 acres. And if you look at a big map, it appears to be out in the middle of nowhere by itself, difficult to manage, probably better off trade to somebody else, maybe, but it's an incredibly important parcel for access, not just in the 729 acres it has right there, but the fact that it's the trailhead for the Forest Service behind it. This was on the disposal list. That won't happen anymore. All right. Now, there are a lot of places where the Forest Service or BLM or other agencies have private land access agreements across the private land that guarantee access to the public lands, which is great. And you can see a project here that was done by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation you know, to basically you know, allow hunters to cross private land, staying within the trail, to get to that national forest behind. So when we were doing the mapping project with Onyx to determine all these landlocked public lands, the project proved to be far more difficult than we thought because we asked the agency where it had legal access rights. And both BLM and the Forest Service basically threw up their shoulders and said, well, we don't really know. It's in cardboard boxes in the basements of our regional field offices. So in part of this project, we had to go through and figure out where those were. So we asked BLM and the Forest Service how long it would take for those guys to digitize all this stuff so it could be on the maps. So when you're on a GPS and you're on your Onyx or whatever your hunt device is, and you're looking and you see where the private land is, you see where the public land is, right now there's nothing that tells you where that legal access right is across that private land because it hasn't been digitized. We asked them how long it would take. They said between 20, 10 and 20 years to have that stuff digitized. This is 2019. All right, so I testified at the Senate Energy Committee last week and recommended that they tell the Forest Service and BLM to get this done soon and give them the resources to do it. Because again, BLM is not, not trying to do it. They just are doing 10 other jobs. This falls to the bottom of the list. It requires some computer capabilities they probably don't have in the office. And uh, it just has to become a priority, like access and recreation have to become a priority for the agencies across the board. All right, and then the last thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of the access issue is uh, maintenance backlog. We talked about these numbers yesterday. You know, the, uh, there are huge numbers, 11.6 billion for the Park Service, combined 2.2 billion for BLM and the Fish and Wildlife Service, about 5 billion for the Forest Service. Some of these are phony numbers. I mean, uh, if you and I you know, build a house, put on a brand new roof, the roof has a 20 year lifespan, 
you know, we get to the end of 20 years, roof still looks pretty good, we're not going to repair it. All right, but it automatically goes on the, the maintenance backlog list. So the problem isn't quite as bad as we see here. This also includes like park service, rebuilding Memorial Bridge in DC. It you know, is the roof of a visitor center, maybe someplace not directly related to access. The place where we have a huge access problem with this, I mean, we've seen the trails and stuff like that in park service, that's a big deal. But for our community, the hunting and fishing community, a much bigger deal is the forest road problem on the national forest system. We built a lot of roads historically on the national forest. And uh, we did not do a very good job of maintaining those roads. Some of them ought to be put to bed, others ought to be maintained because we don't maintain them, they blow out. Not only do they not provide access, then they're dumping all those sediments into headwater streams for trout, salmon, and other species. So again, when I testified last week in the Senate, you know, this has got to become a top priority dealing with the deferred maintenance backlog on forest roads. That is the number one issue in terms of our community, in terms of access to hunting and fishing. All right, so we talked about some solutions. As we mentioned, Land and Water Conservation Fund, the big public lands bill got permanently reauthorized. That is the number one way of dealing with a lot of these management or these access issues. And we don't need to be thinking about it. The LWCF gets a bad rap because people think you're going to be going out there and buying these enormous landscapes and creating whole new parks that are really difficult and expensive to manage. I mean, maybe that happens someplace. I'm all for it if it does. But you can also just buy little projects. That one section of BLM land or private land that connects you know, the public to a 25,000 acre national forest behind it, that is the kind of project we ought to be thinking about in LWCF. Now, Congress, to their credit, recognizes this problem too, so now 3% of the funds appropriated for LWCF have to be access projects like that. And uh, that was up from 1.5% before, and you know, again, that's, when you're talking 900 million, that's pretty significant money for access projects. And obviously, some of the bigger projects can have access issues too, but that's a real good way of doing it. Easements, we've talked about that. We need to get those digitized so you know where those are. Public access on private lands. This is a picture of the block management program in Montana. This is a farm program through the Farm Bill that pays private landowners to open up their land for public hunting and fishing. That also can be connected to a national forest so you can open up a lot more land. Flipmer Forum, we just did that thanks to Secretary Bernhardt. Uh, and then backlog legislation. All right, development. Two types of impacts for development. We consider those direct impact. You know, basically, that is the, all those little pads out there you see. This is the Jonah Field in Wyoming. You know, when you convert sagebrush into a well pad, that is a direct impact on the habitat. A far more insidious problem are indirect impacts. Bird on the right is obviously greater sage grouse, which has been a uh, a real success story in terms of folks coming together to come up with a solution for the sage grouse to keep it off the endangered species list. The sage grouse isn't threatened by an oil pad coming down on top of this lek. That happens sometimes. The much bigger issue is these are birds that evolved to you know, fear avian predators. So, you know, raptors, you know, eagles, hawks, whatever, ravens, whatever it may be. So when they see anything where an animal can perch, they're going to move away. So they see an oil derrick, they see a transmission line, they see a wind tower, they're going to vacate that area and go someplace else to lesser habitat. That is the insidious effect we're seeing on sage grouse populations. Mule deer, big game, you know, very similar you know, type thing. It isn't the fact that you know, we, they're getting hit by trucks. Yeah, sometimes that's happening. It's the fact that we do development in their migration corridors. You know, this is sage grouse. I'm going to pass right over that. We do, migration, we do development in the migration corridors, and that has significant impacts. These are the, the, el the, the science behind migration has become a lot more sophisticated in recent years. These are elk migrations around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Here is a map with all migrations of different big game animals in the state of Wyoming. You know, pretty much every big game animal out there has to migrate. It has winter habitat, it has summer habitat, and it has places that connect those two. And along those places that connect those two, they're what called stopover habitats, which are areas they have to stop and fatten up in order to continue on their journey. Now, in the first phase of energy dominance during the uh, George W. Bush administration, this is uh, some charts of what happened when they developed the Pinedale Anticline in Wyoming. Those are uh, mule deer numbers. Essentially, that development came right in the heart of mule deer winter habitat, winter range. They come down out of the Hoback Mountains or, and uh, then you know, get down on the Anticline, and all of a sudden there are you know, oil derricks there, there are trucks there. They're going to avoid that area. Mule deer do not habituate to development. They will find a different path around it, and uh, it'll be a less efficient path for them. They'll expend a lot more energy. They'll have less good food, 
And over time, you'll see the population consequences like this. The red line on that graph are hunting licenses. So there is a direct correlation between mule deer populations and the ability to hunt for them. Now, the science has really showed how we see migration corridors and how that's changed over time. On the left, that's the way managers used to see migration corridors, skinny little lines you know, through the landscape. Because of the GPS collars, you know, a lot of the, you know, the satellite imagery we do today, what it really is is that image on the right, which shows those stopover habitats, the places where they need to spend some time. And it's not, you can't just protect that tiny little line. You've got to protect enough places for these guys to actually be animals and do what they need to do. So Zinke, to his credit, and Ryan Zinke, the Secretary of the Interior, uh, did, did a Secretary Order 3362, which told the agencies to identify these corridors and work together to conserve them. Uh, it focused on three species initially, elk, mule deer, and pronghorn. And it really talked about the travel routes and winter and summer habitats. And asked the states, each state, to nominate three to five important corridors, and then you know, start taking the actions through the RMP process to avoid or minimize those impacts. Uh, all a great idea. Here are the uh, first three that were nominated in the state of Wyoming. The yellow one up there is the most iconic. That is the Red Desert to Hoback mule deer migration. That's the one you see in National Geographic and tabletop copy books, and it is very cool, and it is a, it's clearly worthy of being you know, preserved. And also, in the big scheme of things, it's a relatively small amount of habitat if you're thinking about development. Unfortunately, after doing the secretary order, BLM then over the last year, these are all the little red spots are leases, and you can see there have been a whole bunch of leases directly in the corridors, and including the upper left there, essentially a gauntlet right across the heart of that red desert to Hoback you know, corridor. Now, when I've talked to Bernhard about this and said, why don't you guys just avoid leasing in those, go through the RMP process, go through that public input about where you're going to do leasing, how you're, where you're not going to do it, you know, what your steps may be involved in that leasing, you know, his response was, we're not going to do that, but if any state wants areas withdrawn, we're happy to withdraw them. So Wyoming, we finally got them the courage to go up and ask for a bunch of these you know, places to be withdrawn, and they have been. But in my mind, you know, Interior has got this thing, you know, it's a fairly craven way of doing it. You're, putting, you're trying to make it look like oil and gas, you're opening up everything, you have energy dominance. Yet you're claiming you're trying to protect these areas, but you're only going to protect them if the state asks you to protect them so they can be the bad guys with industry. That's the way it is. Uh, we're going to work with it as best we can, but it's really not the best way to run a railroad. Essentially, the same thing is happening with sage grass right now, too. All right, so we need to have real protection for key areas, not paper protection. Now, I hope we're going to get there, um, but it, we're not quite there yet. Technology. Our friends at Schlumberger that we do a lot of work with, world's largest oil services company, you know, I show a picture, they show a picture of this pic, uh, the Jonah Field, and I ask them, given today's technology, what can you do in terms of minimizing the surface impacts of this development? And they say, we can get every cubic liter of gas and oil out of that field with 10% of the surface impacts today due to directional drilling, reservoir mapping, and the, the Industry will make more money because you have less pads, less pipelines, less roads, all the rest. We do it this way because this is the way it's always been done. It's not the way it ought to be done, uh, but we're still doing it this way. Mitigate damage. Sally Jewell, to her credit, pushed through some really thoughtful mitigation standards while she was in office that essentially told you to come in and before you do a project, let's figure out what the mitigation is going to be then instead of after you trash an area, then come up and figure out what the mitigation is going to be. Uh, that was undone by the Trump administration when they came in. They also undid the master lease planning process, which is a, a much more inclusive process where you go into an entire area and you think about where you're going to do development, where you're going to have wilderness, you know, where you're going to have migration corridors, where the pipelines, where the roads are going to be. And that is what's been done, obviously, here in Utah in some places, been done in Colorado. It works really well. That, too, was undone by the Trump administration. So right now, we basically have a policy of lease first, ask questions later, which is really not the way you want to be doing this. I will also note that Ryan Zinke referred to mitigation as un-American and extortion. Uh, cleaning up your mess does not seem to be un-American to me, and it hasn't been for industry or for anybody else. Companies are very willing to write a check if they want to do some mitigation that's going to be off-site someplace else. They just want some certainty. And by, with Zinke running around basically trying to blow up the entire mitigation program, 
that does anything but provide certainty to industry. All right, so finally, climate. I would say that hunters and anglers are pretty much on the front lines of the climate change issue. We tend not to be as vocal. I hope that's going to change, but we're seeing it pretty much every day. You have delayed elk migrations coming out of the mountains. We have you know, duck migrations on average two weeks later than they used to be. We have you know, obviously things like catastrophic fire, pine beetle infestation directly related to climate. In places like Montana and other states, we have you know, full closures of rivers because they're getting too hot and too low. And that directly impacts you know, local economies. This is a picture of the Blackfoot River, but we also have these, quote, hoot owl closures on you know, the Jefferson, parts of the Madison, you know, and various other rivers in the state. And this is a direct result of the fact that, A, we're taking too much water out of these streams, but also it's getting a lot hotter and drier than it has been historically. This is, uh, those are moose populations in New Hampshire. You know, the tick line is moving north across the country. Literally, you know, moose are being eaten to death by ticks. The average moose in New Hampshire now, I think it's 47,000 ticks on it because it's not getting cold enough to kill them. Minnesota, for the first time, will not have a moose season, I think, this year because you know, they're experiencing the exact same thing, the crash in the moose population, because it's getting too warm. So, you know, there are a lot of things we can do about it. Obviously, CO2 is a huge issue outside of my pay grade. Uh, sequestration. We have better managed public lands. We do more active management. We take care of a lot of those, you know, blighted areas we have. It's going to reduce the fire risk. It's also good for, you know, carbon sequestration. Connectivity and adaptation. We've talked about that through migration corridors. This is a, that upper right is a project in Canada. We have to be able to allow these animals to move, whether it's a trout, a salmon, a mule deer, an elk, you know, stop over habitat for migratory birds, all the rest. And then we need you know, technology and creative solutions. We can do irrigation a lot more efficiently than we've done it historically. And by doing that, we keep the farmers in business, we keep the streams flowing, and we keep a healthy ecosystem. So with that, I think I'm right on time. Uh, we will close it down and just open up to questions. Am I on? I am on. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we've got uh, several questions that uh, touch on your uh, talk. Uh, excellent talk, incidentally. Thank you. Um, uh, one question, uh, what do conversations with private landowners look like uh, when it comes to creating uh, public access to otherwise inaccessible public lands? Give oh, us a runs, sense yeah, about I mean, that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a, been a long history of conflict between private landowners and the public and, you know, access. And again, I mean, you're, we're not going to go in and tell if any private landowner open up their, you know, land. It's got to be cooperative. So that's why you have things like, you know, easements. That's why you have, you know, the block management program at the Forest Service, I mean, within USDA, which pays, you know, private landowners to open up their lands for public hunting and fishing. It's got to be cooperative. And, uh, you know, we spend way too much time in things like, you know, fighting about stream access in Montana, in Utah, uh, fighting over, you know, you know, the gates that have been closed over private land, you know, some place that accesses public land. I mean, we got to get past this, and I think the agencies have a huge role here. I mean, first of all, they got to be able to tell us where they have legal access rights, and they're not doing that right now. And because, you know, right now, in the absence of that public information, you have gates that are being closed on private ranches all over the West that are legal access routes. But maybe even the private landowner now doesn't even know that because the easement that was negotiated back in the 1970s they're sitting in a basement someplace, and nobody is there watching as they close a the gate. So I think the agencies have a huge role in helping this, but again, nobody wants to tell a private landowner what to do. This has got to be voluntary. Uh, how do we, uh, here in Utah, uh, ask uh, the secretary for oil and gas uh, deferrals? Uh, who does it come from? From the governor or Yeah, elsewhere? the governor is, uh, you know, so basically... Yeah, what uh, you know, Dave Bernhardt has said to me, and I'm actually a Dave Bernhardt fan. I'm supporting his nomination. It makes me a heretic in some of our community. But uh, you know, he has been very clear to me that uh, they are very deferential to states. And if the state of Utah, Wyoming, Colorado has a problem where they're proposing leasing, they, all they need to do is ask, and it'll be withdrawn. And that could be a migration quarters. And as you know, Dave Bernhardt said to me, if Jared Polis wants to make the entire state of Colorado a migration quarter, we will abide his wish. But, I mean, obviously that's not going to happen, but I think that unless, you know, your governor asks, you're certainly not going to get a deferral. 
Another question, is there uh, any movement to have more consistency in uh, state hunting and fishing rules? Uh, that's, that's, that's a deep conversation. Um, you know, that is one of the real inhibit, you know, in, inhibitors in my mind to you know, sort of the accessibility of hunting. If you're a first time hunter and you go in and you open up the you know, state game rules, I mean, it is, it is Greek. I mean, there are different units, there are different measurements, and, uh, but it is all state-based. So, you know, the feds have no role in any of that. And, uh, you know, so if you want to get it changed, you go and you work with your wildlife commission in your individual state. And I think that the, you know, lack of transparency, and lack of, you know, basically clarity in, you know, hunting seasons, you know, is one of the real, you know, things that keeps people out of the sport. Uh it's also noted uh, from your slide that uh, Utah has fewer access problems than uh, neighboring states like Wyoming and Montana. Uh, why is this the case? You know, I really don't know. I mean, I, I would have guessed it was going to be much higher here, but maybe the fact there's so much public land and less private land, it was just there was less, you know, tucked in between. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that one. But I can say that we're also going to be doing the next project with Onyx, or at least this summer, is on state lands. And uh, we think that the problem is even going to be, we have 9.2 million acres of federal lands that are off limits in the West right now because there's no access. And we think the problem with state lands is even going to be bigger than that. Uh, speaking of state lands, it occurs to me that, uh, as, as you know, at, at least with the uh, state school trust lands throughout the West, they're under an obligation to maximize revenues. Uh, uh, how are we going to address that in terms of uh, recreational use and access? Yeah, and I think that, you know, one, you know, I think a lot of those are antiquated and ought to be revisited on each state level. I mean, we're no longer in the you know, 1800s. The local economies have changed significantly, and the way we generate revenue today you know, may be on mountain biking and may not be on mining. And, uh, you know, so I think we need to rethink that entire paradigm, but essentially that's going to be a state-by-state -state process going through that. I mean, you have some states like Colorado, you know, where their state lands are completely off limits to, you know, public access, period. I mean, they're truly set aside for development. If uh, industry wants uh, uh, certainty and they're willing to write checks for mitigation, are oil and gas companies willing to just do the right thing and work with... Uh, uh, the policies that Secretary Jewell put in place? Uh, you know, I think they are. And I think that you're not seeing, the problem isn't the big guys. You know, the Shell, the ConocoPhillips, none of those folks asked for changes in the rules that came out of the Obama administration. It was basically the small, mid-majors, the less capitalized companies, the, you know, I'm sure being a little per, you know, derogatory here, but the bottom feeders of the industry that are pushing this thing. And, uh, you know, I think you go to any of the majors, you know, they don't, they don't want the changes. They don't want to see you know, drilling every place. They don't like the energy dominance terminology. And I think they would much prefer, because I think they are wise enough to know that you know, the pendulum swings and it swings hard. And I think there is a good chance that you know, if there was a different administration here in 2020, that pendulum will swing hard. So I think industry actually has a obligation to stand up and say, you know what, this is not in our interest, not be quiet. The problem is they've just been sitting on their hands. They may not like it, they may tell me something. But they don't tell you know, Trump, they don't tell Bernhard or Zinke. Uh, it's, uh, as you noted, the number of hunters seems to have uh, decreased in recent years. Uh, uh, hunting involves firearms, uh, and the uh, power of the uh, National Rifle Association seems uh, to still be uh, quite strong, if not uh, growing. Uh, any observations on that point? Well, I, I, if, if I'm a wise person, I don't really answer this question at all. Uh, we don't do <laughs> Second Amendment, and so mercifully, because it's just such a polarizing issue that keeps you right away. You can't step in half the offices on the Hill. But in, in my mind, you know, when people, you know, obviously you need guns. And not only you know, do you need guns, you need people buying guns, you need people buying ammunition. Conservation has benefited greatly from the gun boom during the Obama years, maybe for the wrong reasons. But you know, all that money is going into the trust funds, is going back out, and is paying for conservation. So I don't want to see you know that dry up. Uh, I also don't like the you know sort of the rhetoric that comes out and how polarized this issue has become. And I think a lot of you know regular hunters don't like that either. When people ask me what I think about the NRA, I mean I say I, I generally don't answer the question. But what I do say is the thing they have done well is to make any attack on any gun law, any place, an attack on everybody. The conservation community, exact opposite. Attack on mule deer, it's not really a trout issue. You know, it's attack on waterfowl, you know, the pheasant guys don't really care. And we die this death of a thousand cuts. And I, I admire the NRA's ability to unite gun owners around, you know, that proverbial camel's nose under the tent and keeping that from happening. 
Uh, any uh, ideas about uh, uh, education uh, uh, processes or uh, uh, approaches uh, to counter some of the fringe uh, public land ideas like those espoused by the uh, Bundys? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I think that's why it was incumbent on the hunting and fishing community to stand up. I mean, honestly, you know, love the Sierra Club, but nobody cares what they have to say about, I mean, a lot of policy members don't really have, care what they have to say. In fact, if the Sierra Club wants to do something, there's going to be a you know, hard pushback the other way. But when, you know, Bubba, you know, me, you know, the gun owners of this country, you know, stand up and say, you know, when you're, these public lands are all of ours, we paid into this system, this is something that is uniquely American, this is not, you know, the king's lands or anything like that. I mean, this is the, the fundamental framework of what, you know, we do. And we may not have a lot of money and for fishing, we may, you know, we may live in a trailer and buy a really nice truck and really nice boat because that's what really values, what we really care about. And I think that anything that, as long as we're complacent and sit in our hands and don't speak up, then we deserve to get what we get. So I, the good thing that came about the whole Chaffetz situation was, you know, finally the hunting community stood up and made its voice heard and, uh, you know, on a conservation issue. It was happy to make its voice heard on a Second Amendment issue, but, you know, in my mind, you know, I don't care about having a gun if I can't have, don't have anything to hunt. Uh, it, it's uh, noted that uh, the 2001 uh, roadless rule um, that it, uh, individual states uh, have the opportunity to petition for changes in the national rule uh, and that uh, both Colorado and Idaho uh, have uh, done so um, and had their changes uh, implemented. Uh, has that hindered or helped uh, hunting and angling on the public lands? And related to that, uh, Utah has currently uh, filed or about to file a petition uh, to change the rule here in the uh, state of right. Utah. On, yeah, as has Alaska. Lands. So, you know, the broadless rule in general is good for hunting. Um, you know, big game animals in particular need, you know, large swaths of unbroken habitat. And, uh, you know, it, and there are exceptions in that rule if you want to go into wildlife treatment, fire treatment, all the rest. So it's not like, it's not wilderness, it's not the de facto wilderness. It's basically, we're just not gonna develop this area anymore. And the hunting community was strongly in favor of the 2000, I mean, the 2001 roadless rule. Now, you know, I was involved with the renegotiation of the Colorado roadless rule as well as the Idaho when I was at Trout Limited, and both of those turned out great. So, I mean, if a state has different ways that it wants to do things that maintain conservation, but, you know, has, you know, just a very Idaho or Colorado specific way of doing it, yeah, we don't have any problem with that. If Utah, you know, there are some tweaks they want in the rule, uh, same with Alaska, we're fine with it. But, you know, Alaska's, you know, proposed revision of the roadless rule is eliminating it. You know, that's not a good starting point. So we're happy to work with the states on this one, but we like the basic fabric of the roadless rule, but happy to work with them for things that make sense locally, but they do not undermine the basic integrity of the rule. Uh, it's been noted that uh, we're uh, observing generational change on terms of use of the public lands. Uh, are the younger uh, hunters and anglers uh, uh, engaged, and are there enough of them? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know anglers, angling's doing fine. I'm not too worried about that. There has been a big push, the Take Me Fishing you know, campaign you may have seen in ads and on TV, Hispanic, you know, variety of that too. You know, fishing numbers are doing great. Hunting side is much more problematic, but the one thing that's really encouraging is the, the stats on, you know, why people are hunting today and who's coming into the sport. They're not doing it for big heads and, you know, the sport. They're doing it for food. They're doing it for, you know, the experience of the backcountry. And, uh, you know, Mark Duda, in fact, I, I saw, I had it on there. I decided not to show it, but there's a slide that docs been, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years, you know, when you ask people why they hunt, you know, the number one answer now is for the meat. And uh, that is the, you know, the sort of, the folks like Steve Ranella and others who are sort of the young, you know, sort of role model hunters, but who are also chefs. And, you know, this is the way, this is, you know, non-GMO, locally sourced, you know, sustainable, you know, lean protein that we all can get. And it's pretty darn cheap compared to going and buying a big steak in cellophane, you know, in the store. So you know, that's where we're just seeing the growth. And I think that's a really positive thing overall. And I hope more people get into it that way because I think the, the old guys, you know, who only do it because they just want a great big head on the wall. I mean, I think there's still going to be those folks, but, you know, that's not the future of hunting. Uh, it was, uh, your, uh, you invited this next question uh, with your comment that you uh, were supporting uh, the uh, appointment of, a, uh, or pending appointment of Secretary uh, Bernhardt. Uh, could you explain the basis sure. for your um, support? Well, first of all, listen, elections have consequences. 
And I would love to have Sally Jewell still sitting in the Department of the Interior working with her. And, but you know, they, we're not going to have that. And I just had two years with Ryan Zinke, which was incredibly frustrating. And uh, I think, honestly, Bernhardt has, I mean, he's not the second coming of Stuart Udall, but he is a guy that has been in that department for a very long time. You know, a solicitor back in the 2000s. He cares about the department. He is not in to dismantle it like a Scott Pruitt at EPA. And yeah, he's going to pursue a development agenda because that's what President Trump is pursuing. But he will also do things like that secretary order on you know, land disposal, on migration, and I think some other things you'll see coming out of him that are really good. And uh, I would rather have somebody who is smart, who does their homework, who will tell me no if they're not going to do it, and uh, you know, that I can you know, work with. And I think that's somebody with Bernhardt. And I think that you know, if folks get to know him, and I think the, using the example of you know, I think his willingness to let states you know, basically defer all this stuff you know, he's, he's told me he's going to do that, and he's shown that in practice. So, I mean, again, I, he may not be the one I would choose if I'm certain whole cloth, but it's not my choice. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, do you see ways that the, the hunting conservation groups uh, can coordinate uh, more with uh, uh, other conservation groups? Is there a disconnect or misunderstanding between these groups? How can they get together on yeah, the same Yeah, that's a great page? question. I think that our community is the, uh, the general recreation community, the hunting and fishing community, are working better together than we ever have. Um, there are the anti-conservation, anti, you know, anti-environmental, anti-conservation folks do everything they can to widen that divide. I mean, they will come to us and say, oh, geez, you know, the environmentalists are trying to shut down hunting on sage grass. I mean, that's not true. And uh, they will, you know, go to the other side and just say that we're, you know, we're all trying to kill all the grizzly bears. And that's not true either. And I think that, you know, if we ignore, you know, basically those folks that are trying to divide us, there's a whole lot more that unites us than divides us. I mean, we all care about well-managed public lands. We want to see a bunch of wildlife out there. We may experience it in different ways, but great. I and mean, that's part of what makes America great. Great. Whit, thank you very much. We all greatly appreciate your presentation. Well, thank you, Whit. We're going to transition now and talk a bit about recreation along the Wasatch Front. So if I can have Ralph Becker, Carl Fisher, Nathan Rafferty, and Dave Whitakind come down. Oh. Yeah, do you guys, how do you want to? All right, I think we'll lead off with Dave and then uh, Nathan Rafferty from Ski Utah, Carl Fisher from Save Our Canyons, and then Ralph Becker will, will finish us off. So do you guys want to? Uh, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about recreation manage on the, management on the Wasatch Front. My name is Dave Whittick, and I'm the forest supervisor of the UNO Wasatch Cache National Forest. And one of the things that makes us unique is as you look out the windows around here, they talked a little bit about the, the skyline view here and how that compares to Colorado. Uh, I've, I've lived in Colorado, I went to Colorado State University, and as you look out the skyline in Colorado, a lot of people assume you're looking at the forest, and you're not. They're state lands, they're county lands. The forest here is what you see when you look out the window. It's right there, and it's fantastic. Uh, one of the things I have noticed, and it's, it's not a criticism of the program, but I'm the only land manager who's talking in this whole symposium, and I'm honored to represent land managers, and it's probably because we do such a lousy job of telling our own story that everyone else is here to tell it for us, and, and so I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, one of the things also from yesterday as it was brought up, Goldman Sachs, as they recruit here, uh, what did they recruit based on? That they're close to 15 national parks, but yet out the back door is a national forest. In Utah, there are five national forests. So oftentimes, we kind of feel like we get recreated on heavily, but uh, people don't always know they're on a national forest. So sometimes we feel like we get a little bit ignored, and, and yet everybody uses us. And, and we'll be showing some information, or I will be related to that. So I think I just killed the whole thing. There we go. 
Uh, Unawasatch Cache really is literally your forest next door. Uh, the metropolitan areas in this, uh, this area are growing, uh, some of the fastest growing areas in the United States. Salt Lake City is, is growing very rapidly. Utah County's population is expanding very rapidly. And, and those folks oftentimes come here because they want to recreate in these areas. So how many people in this crowd are from Utah, live here right now? So the majority. How many of you were born and raised in Utah? How many of you are here now because you came here on a skiing trip or went to school here or just discovered that, wow, this place is amazing? Yeah, a lot of that. So a whole bunch of imports. And what I often tell people when I speak to crowds that aren't from Utah is, welcome to Utah, look around, now go home. <laughs> because we get, we get so many people who really love it here and then they move here and then, then we have to deal with that. We do have amazing access. This forest is accessible to, we have give or take two million people on the Wasatch Front. And we are literally in people's backyards. There are people whose backyard, if they walk out of it, they walk right into a wilderness area. So we are an incredibly accessible forest. We are right there. Uh, a lot of, lot of routes people can drive to. It's easy to get to this national forest. It's easy to experience it. And of course, we have the greatest snow on earth, and, and this year reflects that very, very well. Uh, the skiing here is very incredible, and, and we're very proud of that, and a lot of people come to experience that, and then, like a lot of you, you don't leave, so it, it can cause problems. Uh, we have a lot of day-use activities. There, I, I can't list all the activities that take place on the forest. It, it really is amazing how many people come here and the things that they do. Uh, and one of the things we did highlight, climbing. A lot of climbers in here, a lot of folks like to do that. There's, there's world-class climbing in a lot of the canyons around here that, that, and, and areas we don't even know of. We discover that a bunch of people are parking in a certain location and one day we find out, yeah, they've been climbing in this area. We, we had no idea. So we, we get a tremendous amount of use. So let's talk a little bit about funding and, and use. Uh, you got a lot of information about that yesterday. Uh, on the Unawasatch Cache, we estimate, based on our visitor use surveys, that we get about 10.7 million visitors a year. That is about equivalent to all of the visitors to the Mighty Five combined. So we get about as many visitors as the, the Mighty Five national parks get only on one national forest. We have experienced in the last five years an 86% increase in overnight developed sites. So if you're trying to get to a campground, you gotta get your reservations in early. Use has skyrocketed there. A 24% increase in use in the general forest area, so dispersed use where people are just going out and camping on their own. And a 56% increase in special events things that we're very proud of, like the Tour of Utah, but also some of the crazy marathons people do running down the canyons. Nobody ever asked to run up the canyons, but running down them. Uh, events like that, recreation events are taking place all the time. The forest is 2.2 million acres in northern Utah with nine wilderness areas, 2,500 miles of trail, 2,500 miles of road, five world-class ski areas, 435 developed recreation sites. So that would include campgrounds, picnic areas, trailheads, day use sites. That's the most of any forest in the national forest system. So we have a lot of developed recreation infrastructure. So let's talk funding. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, heard about that. We have experienced a 50% decrease in effective funding. So you put that together by looking at a 35% reduction over 10 years in our actual funding, and then with, with uh, the inflation rate of 1.5%, it, it, it works out to about a 50% decrease in 10 years. So to put that in perspective, that results in spending of about 30 cents per visitor in our appropriated dollars. So as you go out onto the forest, We'll hand you a couple of slips of toilet paper and, and a pat on the back, and there's your 30 cents. Hopefully you're getting more value than that out of your experience on the forest, but that's the amount of money we can invest in each of you when you're out there. Some of you cost more than others when you leave trash and leave a lot of damage. 
So what are some of the challenges that we face as we go out there? We have quite a few of them. This area is growing tremendously. Uh, the Uinta Wasatch Cache was named as the most endangered national forest in the national forest system based on population growth. We expect that we are going to get way more demand for already overstretched resources. People continue to come here. Uh, we have a lot of shifts in uses. Uh, last year, I was, or it may have been two years ago, I was hiking up the Lake Blanche Trail, well into the wilderness. And there was a sound familiar probably to a lot of you as I was hiking up, that sound of kind of a, a, a big old ball of bees working its way up the canyon. Up the canyon comes a drone. It goes zipping past, probably went all the way up to the Lake Blanche. Somebody was probably sitting down either at the bottom of the canyon or somewhere, checking to see what the trail looked like, and then the, the, the drone went back down. Very effective way of checking trail conditions. We don't use them. The public does. Uh, we have uh, fat bikes that are out there, e-bikes, uh, and our policies aren't keeping up with these kinds of things. Right now, the national policy for e-bikes is a memo written by a director of recreation who is now retired. It's not really very official. And how do we usually respond to those things? Well, if it's new and we don't know anything about it, we tell people, you can't do that. You can't do those kinds of things. And, and you know, that, that doesn't always work out. Uh, to quote Michael Crichton and to tie recreationists into this, life or recreationists will find a way. So if you have a new use, a new toy, you're going to figure out how to use it on the national forest. So we get a lot of use and we struggle. We really struggle to keep up with those kinds of things. And then there is competition. There's always competition for limited resources. Uh, we don't see it as much, but you know you can have competition between motorized and non-motorized. Uh, the ski community, the backcountry skiers are growing rapidly. Uh, they don't want to see developed ski areas expand, and, and helicopter skiers are out there. All that are jockeying for a fairly limited piece of ground on a very small piece of ground. And we're not growing more mountains. Although some would say every year they get steeper. I think that's an age-based thing, but uh, we're, we're not growing anymore. So yesterday we heard a little bit about fire funding too. This graphic illustrates the changes that we've had uh, in, I believe it's 1998. We had over 17,000 employees in the national forest system and far fewer fire folks. Wrap that around to 2015 and that's continued to grow as we've gone. We have way more fire folks and fewer folks working in national forest systems. That results in Recreation folks being stretched, dollars being stretched, we're spending a lot of time fighting fires, chasing those fires, and we're not able to develop, uh, devote the recreation resources we'd like to do. Our uh, focus is also very heavily on fire, and, and uh, the administration has let us know that we need to reduce the threat of wildfire to communities and to everybody. So what I'd like to very quickly talk about are the three T's that we have that we like to focus on in challenges. First is transportation. How do we get people up there? And, and that is often an issue. As you can see by one of these pictures, this is what we like to think of in skiing, and this is what sometimes we end up doing while we should be going skiing. And then once we put people up there, where do they park? Uh, parking is limited, and our land management plan had a goal to really limit parking in that area, so we have not expanded our parking lots. But another analogy, as I learned as a wildlife biologist, nature and recreationists absor abhor a vacuum or an open parking spot. <laughs> so people park alongside the roads. They find places to park. We have those unintended consequences and impacts to the resources. The second T, toilets. Toilets are a big issue. We estimate about over five million people visit these canyons. And as a book came out many years ago, everybody poops. So what you do in the canyon, you're going to drink 24 hours later. That water moves through pretty quickly. So we in, in, in uh, the canyons operate approximately 50 stalls. These don't count the campgrounds uh, for our, our uh, toilet resources. And, and what we have down there are a couple of numbers. One I, I, I need to change slightly. It's 267 
That's the number of rolls of toilet paper that were used at Tibble Fork on Memorial Day one year in one outhouse. 267 rolls of toilet paper in one day. Uh, the other number there is, uh, if I remember right, 96. That's one toilet at Donut Falls in a weekend, but because we don't have the funding to keep a recreation person standing right there with armloads of toilet paper, that's how many they use, which seems like a lot, but they probably ran out numerous times, and the number one complaint of the public on Forest Service lands is toilets. So it takes a lot of work to deal with all that waste, and, and it's, a, it's a big job. The third T we have are trails. This, these pictures are to prove that forest supervisors do get out periodically and can do work. And, and so I was working on a trail as a volunteer because the Wasatch 100 forces people to volunteer on national forest before you can run that race. So I had to volunteer, so I didn't get paid for that, but I did trail work. But trails are a big deal. The public loves trails. You all love trails. But we have a lot of groups who are working on trails. Every community, we have trails groups. We have a lot of folks, and we're not always involved in that. So many of you have probably seen the Super Bowl commercial with the cat herders on horses. That's what we feel like we're doing oftentimes because everybody wants trails. People will build trails out of their communities. People build trails out of their backyards. They all want access. And as was talked about yesterday, those user-created trails are not always in the locations we want. They're not always built the way we want them. So rather than always talk about challenges, we want to emphasize some solutions. We have some fantastic partnerships on this forest. We do partnerships really, really well. One example of that is the Utah Avalanche Center. We have a 9 to 1 funding ratio on that, something I'm both very proud of and kind of embarrassed for. $9 from outside sources for every $1 of federal funding. So we bring in a lot of money on that to help fund the Utah Avalanche Center. We have a fantastic volunteer program. We have had as many as 14,000 individual volunteers on the forest. That's a lot of people who come here to volunteer and do stuff here. Uh, we, we rely heavily on, on uh, counties. Mill Creek is run uh, and funded. Uh, well, we, we run a lot of the operations, but Salt Lake County helps fund that through their fee programs. Uh, we also have uh, fee areas in American Fork Canyon and Mirror Lake. And then we have wonderful partners in like Salt Lake City Public Utilities, who has donated $700,000 to put toilets in the canyons to help us out that way with zero match. Because, as I mentioned, everybody poops. So in summary, uh, we, we have a lot going on. This is my daughter who went out climbing on the forest and, and loved that. We have a lot of opportunities out there. We have a lot of challenges, and I think we have a lot of interest in what we're doing. So we have uh, uh, work to, to create sustainable recreation, maintain our highly effective partnerships, uh, continue working with volunteers, and explore a lot of tools. We've had conversations about impact investing. We've had conversations about increasing the fee areas to the, mil to the, to the Cottonwood Canyons. All of these kinds of things can help us. Uh, you know, the bottom line is we still have a wonderful area out there. The central Wasatch is fantastic. We still have a lot of wildflowers blooming. But what I often tell people to do is go explore the Ashley National Forest. Go discover the Fish Lake National Forest and go see what the Manti LaSalle has to offer because those are wonderful forests that are out there. We have a very engaged public. We have a very passionate public. And really, honestly, it is an honor to be able to work in this area despite the challenges because the rewards and the successes are fantastic. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nathan Rafferty. I'm the president of Ski Utah. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the ski industry here in Utah. And as soon as we get this uh, presentation uh, queued up, I wouldn't be a ski guy if I didn't kick things off with a video. So we've got a little video. Great, didn't work on that thing. Oh, no problem. 
Thanks, Sam. Um, and Dave was talking a little bit earlier about who's from here. I grew up about a mile and a half from here, uh, have spent my, almost my whole life uh, in Salt Lake City recreating in both the mountains. I grew up in the back of a 1978 VW van that my parents had and had me down in southern Utah just about every weekend while I was growing up. Um, and I often think about what an incredible place we live. And when I talk to anybody else who's not from Utah, just an amazing uh, opportunity to be able to go ski powder up at Alta in the morning, play golf or ride your bike in the afternoon, be down at Moab that evening for dinner. Uh, just an amazing, amazing spot we live. Um, we're gonna see if this video works, but some of you may have seen this. Uh, this is a, a video series. This is number five or six from us. Um, and this is about a gentleman who is, uh, we started filming him when he was 95 years old and he's a big skier at Alta. He's now 101 years old and uh, a quick three minute video about George skiing up at Alta. I'm George Jednoff and I'm so happy to be here for another year. I think a lot of it is just willpower. You gotta make up your mind to do it and do it. You gotta, you have to discipline yourself. You have to do what you know you must do. I started, uh, oh, some 30 years ago, uh, a daily exercise program before breakfast from uh, 45 minutes to an hour, I go through some stretching exercise, a little bodybuilding, but m mostly just limbering exercise. It, it has to be a habit. You can't uh, call it an activity that you'll get to. It's amazing how often you just don't feel very, very good in the morning when you start. By the time you get through with uh, 45 minutes of, of this routine, you feel great. As you get older, very often you, you're just not enjoying life anymore. And uh, you let uh, problems uh, overweigh uh, the good things and consequently you're not happy now if you can just get back to uh to living again uh, that's important and you have to push yourself a little bit to do this but uh and uh, you can't expect results overnight and you may never ski as well as you did once before but you can ski and that's the important thing is to keep at it and uh, don't get discouraged, just keep trying. We're up here with yet another great year for George. 101 and a half. It's, uh, it's sun is shining. I mean, Alta couldn't be more beautiful and we're actually having to hold him back. He doesn't want to stop, he doesn't want to rest and uh, I'm just happy to be here with him. I was at one of the Wild Old Bunch dinners and I met this gentleman and he said he was 95 and I said, aha, that's a story. We got a call from Harriet Wallace saying, the gentleman, George Jednoff, who has an iPhone, still drives a car, he lives in the Bay Area, but you know, grew up skiing at Alton Snowbird and I think he'd make a really cool story. And by the way, he's uh, 95. We've been doing this ever since. So we're going to keep doing this till you're like 110. Does that sound oh, good? At least. I don't know. This may be my last. Oh, no. no I, had, <laughs> I had more trouble getting started this day. Well, we'll see. He's an optimist. 
Uh, he said, you know, I may be the most optimistic person you've ever met. He said, I'm 95 years old and I just bought a new pair of skis that all last me about 10 years. And George is about six and a half years into those 10 year skis right now. He well, said, I wouldn't be surprised if I bought another pair. <laughs> He is the utmost optimist. He is the glasses always full. You know, he says, I never give up, you know? And, and he's able to put things into perspective. I don't, he's like a Zen master. As you get older, your eyesight goes bad, your hearing goes bad, your plumbing goes bad. But <laughs> if you can just keep vertical and keep moving and keep positive, that's the important thing. Keep positive. Skiing with George, that one or two days a year we get to ski with him, it just has this, this impact on you that other days on skis do not have. Yeah, George! Make every day count and uh, do something constructive. And the more you can do, especially for other people, the happier you are. So we, um, we produce a ton of content at Ski Utah. You know, really our goal is to inspire people to ski, inspire people to come, uh, come visit Utah. We think we know what we're doing half the time. Uh, most of the time we're producing videos with cool powder shots and people jumping off cliffs. But these George videos, uh, they get viewed and downloaded from our website by a factor of about 10 to 1 uh, in terms of inspirational video content. And when George turned, so he's been, I mean, he is, if you see him at Alta, he's like a celebrity. People are stopped. Everybody wants to stop him and take pictures with him. And uh, a couple years ago, year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, um, we got a call and said, hey, George wants to ski on his birthday, on his 100th birthday. And we thought, well, perfect, no problem. We'll make that happen. When's his birthday? It's in the middle of July. Um, <clears throat> Luckily, uh, it, two years ago, we had a huge, huge winter, and Snowbird was able to push some snow around at the top of their mountain and made a ski run in the middle of July, and we had a big celebration for George. But it was uh, just a reminder um, of how incredible uh, skiing is and, and what it can do for people. Real quickly, just some background on our organization. Um, Ski Utah was founded in 1975. We're a, a privately funded 501c6 trade association. We represent not just ski resorts, but anybody who makes their business from the ski industry in Utah. So retail and rental and transportation, ski shops, uh, obviously lodging. There are lots of organizations, Not I shouldn't say lots, but there are other organizations like Ski Utah all around the country. There's a Colorado Ski Country, there's a Ski New Hampshire, there's a California Ski Areas Association, so uh, they're all a little bit uh, different. We think of ourselves as having the best information for skiing in Utah, and our primary functions, as you might imagine, are are three things, marketing, public relations, and, and public policy. And I do a ton of the public policy work with, with our state uh, government. Um, and real quickly, you know, mission, vision, values, we, went, we had a multi-hour session to figure all this stuff out. At the end of the day, our mission is really our name, is, is Ski Utah, and inspire the world to ski in Utah. And we want people to come and visit our state to ski instead of going to our competition in California and Colorado, which all offer incredible ski experiences. But we want them to come ski and spend time in our mountains uh, instead of going to the beach or instead of going to Disneyland as well. Um, and I imagine you can guess what some of our primary selling points are. It's on our license plates, the greatest snow on earth, um, access, which has become a challenge in these last several years for sure, but we hang our hat, hat on that and we hear, we get feedback from people that come and visit Utah all the time that we, we love coming to Utah because it's easy in and out. You know, that airport is 35 minutes away from uh, a handful of ski resorts, we say um, an hour away from 10 or 11 of them. And, and certainly variety, you know, we've got 14 ski resorts in the state, like I said, 11 from the airport, um, and we've got a ton of them jammed right up there in the central Wasatch, um, which is we're going to get into later, it presents some challenges for sure, but it's a, 
you know, it's a, our, uh, our cup runneth over in terms of the difference in the ski experience. I mean, Alta couldn't be any more different than Deer Valley. And as the crow flies, they're seven miles apart. Uh, and it's a great, uh, great thing for us to be able to offer people who come and, and visit us. Um, real quickly, this tells you a little bit about our organization. The second question I always get is, well, how are you guys funded? Do you, you get state dollars? Do you get... Uh, you, we're, we're essentially um, funded by the resorts. Those gold and silver passes are uh, season passes to the state. We sell those and the resorts allow us to keep all the revenue for those. We have about a $3 million budget for our organization. We take all those dollars and pump them back into the market to, in the form of either print advertising, going to consumer shows, lots and lots of digital advertising, but you know, all with the idea that we want to get people to come back here and visit us in Utah. Um, we produce a magazine, uh, we have, we're a membership association, we have a handful of sponsorships as well. Um, so there are various ways we make money, but we're, we're different than a lot of like a Visit Salt Lake or a traditional, say a Park City Convention and Visitors Bureau, where they're getting uh, a portion of tax revenue from a, generally a TRT transient room tax. So when somebody stays in a hotel, they get a portion of that that then they put back into the market to get people to visit. We don't have that luxury. We've, we've got to, um, we got to earn everything we go out and spell, uh, spend. Another interesting thing is people ask us, how, how do we stack up against the other guys? And when you look at, uh, we measure our success or, you know, one metric anyway is, um, is skier days. And so that's essentially lift tickets sold. And the four states that you see up there are the states that sell the most lift tickets. And this may surprise some people. People often think of Utah and Colorado as, as being neck and neck. We sell about, we do about four and a half million skier days. Vermont does about the same. They've vacillated back and forth between anywhere between four and five million skier days. They're also a tank of gas away from 85 million people. So we think we're a drive market with two million people in the Wasatch Front or so, um, but they draw people from a lot of different places. Our real competition comes from a place like California that does between six and seven million skier days and a place like Colorado that has 30 ski areas and they do, they'll, they'll easily do this year 30 or 13 million skier days this year. They are, uh, they are the big grill on the block for sure. So quickly where these skiers come from, about a 60-40 split between out-of-state and local visitors, 60 being out-of-state and 40 in-state. Quarter of the visitors come from, you know, these big population centers. Our biggest market is uh, Orange County and New York. Half of our non-resident skiers coming from these places that, you know, not impossible to guess that California, New York, Texas market, Florida, Boston, uh, those spots are hotbeds for skiers and the highest kind of region, not broken out by state or regions, but New York and LA, San Francisco, DC, mostly places that have really great air access too. All these places have good nonstop uh, destinations. And our international has been up. Uh, I think it's taken a little bit of a turn uh, the last year or so because the dollar has been so strong. Um, but um, we have seen international visitation up. And then this is just another slide that shows those, those visit by designated market areas. And, and of course, um, the Utah is tops, but international. And then those other markets that I talked about. Here's a, just a quick snapshot of skier visits uh, nationwide. And we're seeing fairly flat visits uh, nationwide. The, the thing we talk about in our industry all the time are the aging out of baby boomers. So baby boomers have been um, traditionally our strongest segment. They have the money and the time to ski, and we are on the tail end of those baby boomers. And between the baby boomers and the millennials, which is a bigger bump than the baby boomers, uh, is a big trough. And luckily, uh, through technology in the form of better grooming, uh, wider skis, high-speed lifts that are uh, slower and easier to load, um, you're seeing um, more and more people skiing. Utah skier visits, uh, our trend looks a little bit differently, and I think you're going to see that that green line was because 
um, the snow really stunk last year. But you're going to see, not surprisingly, that line, the next one we put in there, are going to be uh, possibly pretty darn close to 5 million skier days, four and three quarters is my guess. Here's what snowfall looks like. Um, those are the, the red line is the average, and then the bl dark blue line is where we are this year. The light blue is two years ago. The green on the bottom was the awful snow year we had last year. I know I'm spilling over on time, but I've just got a couple extra slides here. Um, skiing is big business in this state. Big, big business. Total ski and snowboard related spending in Utah is over a billion dollars. And that was last year in our crummy snow year, uh, 1.3 billion. And the year before that, 1.4 billion. Out of state international visitors spending 337 bucks uh, a day. Utah residents, certainly a lot lower than that, $107 a day. Um, but uh, clearly some big benefits to our state. Um, internet, uh, the ski and snowboard related, and this is just out of state spending. So these are people that come here, spend their money. We don't educate their kids. They don't drive on their, our roads as long as they're, you know, other than the week they're here skiing. But uh, local and take state tax revenue is $225 million in, in savings per household. So every person, well, anybody who lives in Utah, their household gets $232 of tax savings per household. Carl even can go and almost buy his family lunch at Deer Valley for 232 bucks. So he's, uh, he's saving that money. Um, and clearly uh, a ton of jobs for the state of Utah. So um, I know we're on a tight time schedule and we'll have questions later, but that's mine. Thank you very much. All right, um, I have no slideshow. Um, we have no videos at Save Our Canyons. We're still operating off of Alexis Kellner's printing press in his basement. Um, so, um, but no, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I attended my first Stegner Center Symposium when I was 18, uh, 18 or 19 years old. Um, it was 20 years ago, and it's, uh, it's a real honor to be on the other side of, of this uh, for me, so thanks for having me. I'm here to talk a little bit about Save Our Canyons and some of the challenges we're seeing in the, in the Wasatch Mountains um, and some of the work that's been done uh, over the past several years to try and uh, tackle some of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, so Save Our Canyons started. Um, from uh, a recreation organization, from the Wasatch Mountain Club, uh, who was concerned that um, we were recreating in these places, but that we weren't uh, doing things to sustain and protect the recreation experience in the, in the Wasatch uh, Mountains. Um, and really, the catalyst for us was the formation of Snowbird Ski Resort in 1972. Um, and the, the kind of that, that corporate, very corporate kind of ski model uh, coming uh, to the Wasatch Mountains, and that um, was very concerning uh, to our founders. And um, really, I think the question, you know, you, you can talk about uh, backcountry skiing is better than resort skiing or uh, all these different uh, things going on in the, ca in the canyons, but. Uh, it really boiled down to this for our organization is could the canyons handle that intense that intensification of of use um, so yeah we weren't so concerned we're, we're not really concerned about any one activity in the canyons uh, we're concerned about all of them because we think the recreation and the visitation regardless of what you're doing um, it's having impacts on this place and um, the, uh, the values um, that we have for the Wasatch Mountains um, that, that our community, that our membership uh, holds, um, are, um, are, we feel like they're being compromised. The values of this place, watershed, um, wildlife, um, opportunities for solitude. You know, when you have, I think, so we did a, a, a survey um, with the, you went to Wasatch Cache National Forest and, and uh, 
surveyed people for a full calendar year in the Wasatch and, and counted. We figured about six million people are coming just to the central Wasatch uh, mountains. Um, Tri Canyon area. That's a that's a lot of that's a lot of visitation for for three canyons. And it far, I mean, the the area is about 80,000 acres of of public land right in that area. So put that in in the context of the visitation of a place like um, Zion National Park. Um, you know, it's probably twice the size of the Central Wasatch Canyons and um, has, has more funding, for sure, to steward, uh, steward the resources there. And they're at about 4.3 uh, million visits a year. So we're more than, we're half the size of the Zion with you know, significant more visitation to the area. So honestly, what, what Save Our Canyons is trying to do is saying without a plan, for what we want this place to be in the future, and we tend to look 50, 100, or more years uh, out, um, um, what, what is this place going to be? Or, what, do we want to, what, what do we want it to be, and how are we going to get there? So, um, you know, fast, fast forwarding to today, what do we see in the canyons? I mean, you saw a slideshow from the forest super, or a slide from the forest supervisor showing traffic jams. Um, to us, that's an indication that, yeah, maybe, maybe the canyons couldn't hold the ski industry that we have up there today. And we're not advocating for, for removing that or taking that away, but um, there's, there's some, some real um, impacts to this place that we're seeing um, because of the visitation and the explosion of population and the explosion of, of recreation and people uh, uh, going up there. And I think it's important that people uh, go up there. Um, but we think that perhaps, you know, the ski area, the uphill capacity of the ski resorts has outpaced the infrastructure that's feeding the ski resorts being the two, the two state highways. Um, and we are, we have to, I always try and remind, I had the opportunity to go on um, a ride along with UDOT, just a couple, uh, the last big storm that we had here. I uh, woke up at three in the morning and uh, found myself over at the UDOT maintenance shack and, and plow, going up to plow the roads with the, with the plow drivers. Um, it is, it is an insane, Little Cottonwood Canyon, which is where I went up, it is a war zone to get that canyon open by 8 a.m. Um, you have the heaviest of heavy machinery uh, going up there. There's a, you know, plow trucks with wings that they can plow the road in like one swoop, and they probably go up and down the road five times. Um, there's a snowblower that you drive uh, with about eight-foot-tall blades um, that is blowing snow up on the sides of the hill. You have uh, military ammunition <laughs> flying overhead. You have uh, Gazex exploders. It's just in the middle, of the, there's just flashes and bangs and booms, and the sun's not even up. Um, it it kind of flies in the face of your, your picturesque, peaceful, alpine glow uh, mountain morning up there. Um, so, and that's what we're doing just to get people to play up, up in our watershed, right? So I think the, those are the types that when we talk about our values being compromised, it's those types of things that are happening. And you know, there's proposals to uh, put more, more of those exploders all throughout the, the, uh, the, uh, the canyons, right? So it's, you're topping out this beautiful climb on some of the best granite in the country, and you, you, you finally get to the top of a 1,000 or 2,000 foot climb, and you're looking down the barrel of a, an explosive device. Um, it's a little jarring. Um, is that the experience that we want to be leaving to, to future generations? So planning, that's, that's um, planning um, and not perpetual planning. I think we have been planning for about 30 years. And what we've been, uh, what our, our failure is, I think the failure of um, former uh, prior, prior generations has just been that we've been stuck in planning. We're perpetually planning. We gotta put our pens down and we gotta start acting because the changes are coming um, to the central Wasatch Mountains. Um, and if we don't embrace and, and try and control the change and grab the bull by the horns, uh, the bull is gonna uh, take us for a, for a ride. And I think we are on that ride right now. Um, and the, 
I, I talk a lot about the with the ski industry, you know, it, it, and and I think even with uh, recreation, we always want one more, one more trail, one more ski lift, uh, one more. But it's been going on for decades, right? And at some point, we're going to cross this this threshold where we've 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 whittled this place away, um, and we've lost. Um, what it is that's important about the, the Wasatch uh, Mountains and this place, and, and compromise the values of our community. So in um, 2012, we saw this happening. We had played out on the floors of Congress. Um, and we were, we were working with then uh, Congressman uh, Jim Matheson to expand upon uh, the wilderness areas in the central Wasatch, not because we hate uh, you know, recreation up there, but we think that wilderness protections um, help to um, protect the values about this place that can only be, be lost. And we worked really hard to, to work around trails and, and make sure that people could still enjoy the place while protecting some core areas of the resource. Um, but then another bill to um, facilitate a ski area expansion right through the middle of one of those wilderness units also went to the floor to Congress. So we were in a spot where we were, the United States Congress was going to decide the fate of the central Wasatch Mountains. And fortunately, um, our, our local elected elite leaders uh, finally got involved and said this is not this is not how we should resolve these issues. We need to we need to uh, um, we need to build some consensus, and we need an we need an accord. And, and from that, we found the Mountain Accord uh, process, which engaged you know um, hun hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders, thousands of people from the general public. Um, I think uh, I was talking to Dave Fields from Snowbird a couple a couple of weeks ago, and we decided, I think I have probably, each of us have probably spent about 10,000 hours, uh, each of us, working on Mountain Accord. Um, and the, from the vision to now where we are with the Central Wasatch Commission on trying to implement some of these ideas and these goals. Um, so, and it's, that was a really good process, but there's still, it's, um, I think there was a lot of agreement, but it wasn't 100%. And I think right now we're at this point is to do something for the landscape, do we need 100%? Um, there's, there's always going to be winners and lo losers, I think, in these types of, uh, um, in these types of protections or these land, land deals as they are. Um, I don't know what the right answer is. I certainly, we certainly as an organization have our ideas of what we would like uh, to see happen for the central Wasatch Mountains. I know Nathan has his ideas of what he would like to see for the central Wasatch Mountains. Um, but I think the important thing is, is that we do, we, we have to do something. We have to be decisive. Otherwise, we're going to, to lose what's important about um, about this place. So a few things that I do know, so we've done plans, right? Back, back to the early 70s, there have been plans for the central Wasatch, whether you're talking about, um, you know, the, the first Alta and Little Cottonwood study that was done in 1970-ish, um, the 1989 Wasatch Canyons Master Plan. Um, you have the um, 1999 city watershed plan. You have the 2003 revised forest plan. What's interesting, if you go through all of these documents, they're really not saying that different of a thing. Um, they're, they're all saying the same thing, and I think what, uh, what the Mountain Accord did is it synthesized all of those things. There are not new ideas, there's just been a failure to act. And, and we need to change uh, policies, both at the local and at the national level, to implement some of these things. Because um, we can't do things for transportation without changing certain laws. And, and those laws probably take an act of Congress. We also want to mitigate against some of the, the adverse impacts of, of improving the visitation um, up there. You know, I reminded, I've, I talked with um, 
uh, Superintendent Brady Baugh down at Zion National Park because it's like, man, they did this amazing thing. They got all of their visitors on mass transit. And I was like, how is that working out for you? And it's like, man, it's great. We're getting like millions of people into the park. Uh, and he's like, but, and then there was a big but we are experiencing unprecedented resource damage because of that visitation, right? And, and when we go to these places, we need amenities because I think as the forest supervisor pointed out, everybody poops. We need at least uh, those restrooms. So do we want the Cottonwood Canyons to be lined with, with vault toilets up and, down, up and down the canyons? Is that what we're going up there for? Do we want to create more parking spaces? I personally don't go up into the Wasatch Canyons to see a parking lot. I, I can go to Walmart for that. Um, I go up there to see wildflowers. I go up there um, to expand the, 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 um, the knowledge and, and my, my children's sense of place. Um, I go up there to be, be with friends. I go up there for adventure. Um, I go up there for quiet. Um, and I think all of those things are at risk of being lost if we don't come together and act. Um, so I think we need to identify the values. We need to do it collectively. We need to find transportation solutions and, um, and, and not just a transportation solution to solve transportation problems, but a transportation solution to get us to the desired condition of these mountains that we want to have and that we want to leave behind for future generations. I was really struck by that uh, comment, um, the proverb that uh, Secretary Jewell shared with us yesterday, right, about borrowing these places uh, from future generations. Um, so you know, I want to eliminate kind of this, this N plus one. You know, we got to figure out what, what trails and where and, and what values do we want. Are, is, are wildlife populations important? We've lost a lot of species in these canyons. Um, we need, I would, I would personally like to bring a lot of those species back into the central Wasatch because that's the value that I, that I hold dear. Um, we need more funding. Man, watching uh, Nathan's slide about all the money uh, that's coming in from the ski industry, I'm sure the Forest Service would like to get their fingers on a little bit more of that um, to, to bump up that 30 cents per visitor number, right? Um, so we need to figure out f uh, sustainable funding sources. But at the end of the day, we need to change our behaviors uh, for the central uh, about the central Wasatch. It's fun to be up there. It's a beautiful place. Uh, there's no other place in the world where you have a million plus people um, immediately adjacent wilderness areas and, and high mountain peaks like this. I don't think there's any place in the world. Um, so we need, to be, we need to change our behaviors. And if it snows, I mean, as much as I love to ski powder, like, sorry, I'm not going up there uh, on a powder day. I'm, I'm that guy, you can have my turns. But, like I, val I value my time uh, more than sitting in traffic for, for four hours to and from a ski area that's 20 minutes away from my house on a, on a summer day. And I think we have to also remember we're going into, the, we're going into an alpine environment in the wintertime. I don't think it should always be so comfortable. Um, you know, and I think we've we've tried to we've made these places too comfortable and too accommodating, and that's part of the visitation uh, challenge that we're seeing. So I think we need to change our our behaviors, and people are people are part of the landscape. I, I truly believe that, but people didn't always have uh, Gore-Tex and dry down um, or uh, all all of the the fancy gear that we have today that's really enabled us to be more comfortable in in harsh conditions. So I, I kind of leave you with that uh, just about thinking about how we might change our behaviors to to save what's important about this place. Thanks. Uh, good morning, and I'm, uh, I'm Ralph Becker, and I'm uh, currently the executive director of the Central West Edge Commission, which was referred to, and I will, uh, I'll get to in the course of, of some of my remarks here. Um, first, uh, thank you to the Segner Center. I know that uh, over the many years I've been coming to various forums and this symposium, I've not only learned a lot, but it's inspired me to, I think, to do 
the work that you all are here because you care about uh, as it relates to public lands and these, uh, and these resources. And not just getting inspired, but then also the work that's done around educating folks, um, around building collaborative practices. Um, the solutions are really uh, with us, if we're gonna find them, and figuring out how to do it, not just through lawyer-like litigation, but through lawyer-like uh, mediation and, and, uh, and consensus building. Um, I, um, I, I, others have been talking quite a bit about the Wasatch, and I'm not gonna uh, duplicate their, uh, their remarks, but let me sort of relate this first for me personally and then talk a little bit about kind of the journey that we're on, I think, in trying to come to solutions as it relates uh, to this uh, magnificent range we're in. Uh, I moved here 45 years ago uh, to go to the university or to go to, go to law school and other graduate school. And when I came here, this was, the mountains were a very different place. Uh, my first year I went up and put on some skinny wooden skis with no, uh, no edges, no metal edges, uh, and slippers, they were called alpha boots, those of you who remember the three-pin system. Um, and I went up uh, completely unaware of what I was getting myself in for, and, uh, and took a nice little tour up at the top of Big Cottonwood Canyon in what today is where Brighton has expanded into in the Great Western Lift, and sort of learned how to backcountry ski. That was telemarking in those days. Um, and uh, and learned, learned that experience. Uh, Salt Lake was also a relatively sleepy city. It was still a city, um, but our population has just about tripled um, in the time that I've, that I've lived here. And what we see with these mountains is this incredible resource. Um, many of you are from here, most of you are from here. Uh, but as Carl mentioned, there is no other city in this country that has in its backyard, literally backyard, uh, the kind of access and opportunity to a, a, a mountain and desert natural experience uh, that we have in this city. Um, and that is treasured by virtually everyone. It is the central place-making feature um, of this whole region. Um, and not only do we get a chance to enjoy it and have it nourish us, uh, but we also have, because it's so easily accessible, a chance for our kids to be able to learn, learn and grow up um, from the experiences that we share uh, still today. And I, I literally, every time I go out, whether it's skiing or hiking uh, with friends and family in this area, every one of us comment on how lucky we are to have this resource here. Because there isn't, you know, those of us who have been in other places know that there's just nothing, uh, nothing quite like it. Uh, with that, though, uh, the pressures, as has been described so well uh, by others here, uh, have mounted to a point where the threats and the conflicts just intensify um, over time. And decision making today is particularly difficult. I mean, we live um, in a time when, uh, unlike any time in my uh, conscious lifetime, in terms of both the amount of conflict, uh, how jumpy people are around anything political, um, and how easily triggered we are with people who we disagree with, uh, and how disagreeable people are given the most attention. And that is not a good form for resolving conflict. And we face it here in Salt Lake, as, as is true, as true around the country. Um, it's been, it's been described a little bit about the, the history of, of kind of decision making and planning in these mountains. Um, it really goes back to almost the very earliest days of settlement in this valley uh, when people realized the value of these mountains um, for watershed protection um, as well as the resources, whether it was mining resources for a relatively short period of time now as we look back on it. Um, or, or grazing resources. 
Um, and recreation is really a post-World War II phenomenon in terms of any, uh, any significant um, use in these mountains. Uh, but there has been a very long history and tradition of both incredible protection in these mountains uh, from the time that City Creek was literally handed over to Salt Lake City as the primary source of water for Salt Lake City um, uh, to the, um, uh, to the I'd say, more, more recent times of the more than 20 jurisdictions that now have responsibility uh, in these mountains um, and, are try and, are, and are trying to work together. Uh, one of the things that I learned in my time uh, as mayor that I really didn't appreciate uh, is that another thing that we've seen about with these mountains over the years is the incredible cooperation, particularly among jurisdictions, uh, to prioritize and recognize the values that need to be uh, respected and uh, need to be managed in a way that brings, uh, that brings results that protect these mountains. Most watersheds, this is watershed for over 500,000 people in this valley. Uh, most watersheds in the West are actually off limits to much human use. And as you've heard, we have more human use in these mountains right here than we have in all five of the national parks combined. So to be able to balance those uses, protect the resources, provide for conflicts among all the recreational users, which is obviously the dominant use in the canyons today, um, is a challenge that has been successfully uh, negotiated. Um, I'm going to outline, I think, some, uh, try to outline some points, and some of these have been, have been said, but just to sort of reinforce the context for decision making here. The Wasatch Mountains, I mean, we are, is an incredibly steep range and it's an incredibly narrow range. It is 12 miles across. So all these activities we're, call, we're talking about occur in a very narrow place. Um, it's um, uh, also a place that we all see and, and experience even just visually every day. You know, we can look out these windows behind us and everyone wants a window. Uh, to remind ourselves of what a beautiful uh, place we're able to live in. Um, it serves as, uh, I say, a central place, as we've heard from Nate, in terms of economic, uh, uh, both opportunity, but also uh, economic uh, meaning for the state. Uh, but it is also a place where there is wilderness, and somehow those two uh, have, been, uh, have been accommodated. Um, it is also a place that gives us a first-hand view on the effects of climate change. Uh, the changing snowpack, uh, the change in the need to provide water supply and how we're going to provide that water supply in the future, changing vegetation, changing wildlife patterns, all of those things are front and center um, in these mountains and are both things that are going to cost us a lot in terms of trying to deal with changing infrastructure uh, but also are, have incredible effects on the future of the ski industry in the not too distant future. I mean, we're already seeing it. Ask any of the ski areas about uh, their need for snowmaking today compared to 20 years ago uh, and what that means in terms of, of using uh, water that's uh, owned and, and really uh, uh, managed by Salt Lake City. And it's, uh, um, it is an issue that has to be addressed uh, locally as well as uh, turning our attention to it across the globe. Most of these lands are owned by the public. Uh, thankfully, we've got an incredible forest supervisor uh, in Dave Whittakin, who is uh, both attuned to and spends a lot of his time uh, in these mountains and understands the delicate balance uh, for us today uh, and going forward. Another 20% is actually owned by Salt Lake City. A lot of people don't realize how much uh, land Salt Lake City has bought over the years to protect its watershed, and then 20% of it or so is private. <coughs> uh, and as Carl has mentioned, we have had decades of plans, and they all actually point to the same conclusions. Every time we go through one of these processes, uh, going back in a really sort of comprehensive way, I'd say 30 years, we've ended up at the same place. And the most recent of those um, was, the, uh, was this Mountain Accord effort. Um, and um, it was, uh, from its beginning, its goal was to achieve consensus. 
And at the end of the day, that accord was signed by the governor, leaders in the state legislature, every local government, all of the ski resorts, all the conservation groups, and dozens of other people you know, who had been involved and were interested in the public. So it did reflect uh, that consensus. There were, th I'd say, three main things that came out of that, um, out of that uh, uh, work. Uh, one of them was to pass federal legislation that's been referred to to create a new designation, to authorize land exchanges, to sort of put in their right places land ownership patterns that reflected where the public land should be on the mountain sides and where the private land should be in these mountains at the base of the ski areas. Um, another area was to address these transportation issues that uh, I think have reached, uh, by most people's estimation, a real sort of crisis point this year. As, as has been mentioned, people are waiting two, three, four hours plus to get up and down these mountains. Uh, and that's not acceptable uh, for those of us who appreciate the need, need for access. Uh, there is one other element that came out of it that has uh, emerged uh, that I just want to mention and refer to here. And that was a, um, a recommendation to create an overarching uh, governmental entity to oversee um, and coordinate what's happening in these mountains. Uh, that was formed. Uh, anytime you get uh, 10 jurisdictions together, uh, it's never easy to exactly agree on that, but by interlocal agreement, all of the local governments in the state of Utah now have this commission made up of elected officials to try to implement the Mountain Accord um, Agreement uh, and to play a coordinating role and supportive role for all of the jurisdictions, and there are more than 20 uh, jurisdictions with responsibility in the canyons. Um, We've really fortunate, I'd say, the commission is formed, it's underway. I started uh, working with them in June of last year. Uh, we're really fortunate that every one of those elected officials is absolutely committed to problem solving and the, both recognizing the value and, the, and carrying out the, the solutions that were arrived at in Mountain Accord. Uh, but as, uh, as can often happen going forward, uh, the Mountain Accord was signed in the summer of 2015. Over time, players change, uh, whether it's private or public sector players and elected officials, um, and circumstances change. And with that, the agreement, which is agreement like this, which is always fragile, tends to fray, uh, both fray in terms of the substance of what people agree to, uh, but also fray in terms of personalities. And those two are always sort of challenging parts of any, uh, of any agreement in reaching, reaching uh, conclusion. So while we've had this, I think, really, uh, I'd say, successful both history and, and current tone of, um, of collaboration and support, actually getting the necessary actions done, and this is what uh, Carl was referring to, uh, getting those necessary actions done uh, takes a sort of another level of commitment. And it takes a commitment from the decision makers, and those are often the elected officials, not at the local level, because at the local level there's agreement, but particularly at the federal level, to take stands that aren't universally popular and to play out in agendas that aren't about our local mountains, they're about someone's view on public lands and whether they should be public or what the federal government's role should be as it relates to our public lands and things that seem pretty far removed to us when we're all working uh, together locally. Um, we're seeing certainly the challenges of that. And I think the, the test is going to be uh, whether or not, literally I would say in the next year or two years, uh, we're able to bring people back together in some cases where there's been division, uh, keep people together long enough uh, to get decisions made, and then to uh, have elected officials, not at the local level, but at the federal level, who have the fortitude to go, you know, we know that some of this is challenging in their dimension, uh, but to support 
the values that we hold for these mountains and, for the, and to respect the local community's wishes, uh, we are going to take the action to try to assure that in the, for the next generation and generations uh, that we've set the stage to have the quality of place and experience that so many of us uh, enjoy um, and appreciate today. Um, the one thing that keeps everybody together in this, um, regardless of the kind of wild character and personality differences or regardless of the, uh, the differences about what the solutions maybe should be, are, is the underlying uh, belief in the value of these mountains. And there are a lot of times we have to remind ourselves of that uh, when we get in, these, in some of these tough, more disagreeable moments. Uh, but my uh, confidence comes uh, from the fact that we care so much about these mountains and the role that they play in our lives uh, and, the, um, and the need uh, to make sure that they're there uh, for our kids and their kids. So thank you. Thank you all. That was that was really an enlightening. Um, we had a lot of questions, so I apologize in advance. There's no way we're going to get to all of these, but I will try and, and synthesize as best I can and hit on some common themes. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up is carrying capacity. Uh, how much use and visitation can the canyons uh, accommodate? Do we draw a hard line and limit visitation? Do we increase uh, the amount of infrastructure and hardened facilities to accommodate all the people that want to come? So I'd, I'd ask each one of you, what are your thoughts on is there a limit? What is the appropriate way to um, address the increase in visitation? Uh, carrying capacity does come up pretty frequently, and, and there are a lot of aspects to it. So w one of the examples I'd give is if I slide over here like this to Carl, uh, he, he may be tensing up right now, I've exceeded his carrying capacity. <laughs> but, but yet I might be able to do that with Ralph and he's just got a big grin on his face. So um, as, as you go in and have a recreation experience, uh, to, to tie that to something else, uh, I hiked up Lake Blanche another time, uh, Sands Drone, and, and there were people all the way up and down that trail. And when I got up on top, everybody was happy. They were thrilled with their experience. Yet there may be somebody else who would be in the backcountry, and if they see one other person, then this area is ruined and I gotta go somewhere else. So visitor carrying capacity, visitor experience is deeply personal. Now, as far as how it impacts the resources, that's a whole different question. Are trails sustainable? Is the recreation resource sustainable? Are we moving wildlife out of an area? Are we having trails that we cannot maintain? Can we pump all the toilets that we have up there? Uh, and, and we're trying to answer those questions. And, and in part, we've also been working with, uh, through Mountain Accord and now the Central Wasatch Commission, one of the working groups they have, have, have a couple of professors from the U, and I believe they're going to try to take this on. It's, it's really difficult to assess because there's so many aspects to it. I might just, yeah, I, I think we've done some studies. Um, uh, and I mentioned our recreation visitor study for the Central Wasatch. Um, it was actually really interesting because when the Utah State who did the analysis, they said this is the most bizarre thing we've ever seen from the social aspect. Um, people are going up there for solitude. That's one of their values. But they are encountering other people. And so we asked them, uh, does that uh, detract from your experience? And people said, no, it actually enhances our, our experience in these mountains, which, which is interesting. So I'm less concerned about um, the social 
aspects of carrying capacity, and I'm, I'm most concerned about the ecological impacts. Um, and again, it goes, if you value wildlife, we've driven wildlife out because of use. Human use has, has run out uh, species that, that used to inhabit these areas. So if that's something that's important, that should be one of our, our metrics that we measure for. If you value clean drinking water that we don't have to spend gobs of money uh, to clean up because we can, but I, I'm a firm believer that if it's, if it's pure, why not do everything we can to keep it pure? I don't really care to drink uh, treated water or, um, you know, yeah, you can, you can drink uh, sewage water now. We have the technology to do that, but there's something that's just, uh, that doesn't sit well with me personally. So um, I think those are the metrics that we need to be using to inform carrying capacity. Um, you know, it's a great question, um, and as Carl alluded to it earlier, you know, there are days, especially now in Little Cottonwood Canyon, and we're seeing it now um, with the change in the, the pass structure in Big Cottonwood Canyon, um, where people are lining up in their cars and they're waiting hours to go skiing. And part of me is blown away why anybody would wait that long, sit in their car for a couple runs. I, I did it the other day and I did the math on it. I waited. I, I live in Park City. I drove over to Alta um, and I skied five runs in two and a half hours. Well, it took me two and a half hours to get to Alta that morning because I got up early, got in line, parked my car, sat there and talked on the phone for a while and and made it up there. For me, it was worth it. It was. <laughs> it, it also snowed 26 inches that night. So uh, it is a, just. Ab I'm, I'm just blown away by the passion of people and what they will do uh, to ski and, and recreate there. You know, one thing that I think is interesting when it comes to carrying capacity, and I, I don't have a great answer. Maybe the ski resorts have a better answer, but it really varies widely when you're talking about a ski resort for many, many different factors. And the most dramatic one that I can think of is, is the snow. And not only how much snow there is, but when it snowed last time. And take Snowbird for an example. You know, I don't know what their base is right now, but it's probably 120 inches, and they are 110% open. They are skiing wall to wall, and the skiing is really, really good. Uh, wind the clock back a year ago, and the skiing was not that great, and people were not venturing off the groomed runs very much. So when you take 5,000 people at max-ish capacity, uh, or say just say a busy day at Snowbird, you take those 5,000 people, spread them out over 100% of the resort, it doesn't feel so bad. When you put them, squeeze them all onto a groomed run, uh, or the few groomed runs that Snowbird has, it's a very different experience. Um, another example is lift capacity. You know, our, we now have chair lifts that hold six people uh, to a chair. Uh, Big Sky has one that holds eight people. They're high-speed quads now. Deer Valley and Alta are approximately the same acreage. Uh, Deer Valley has 22 lifts and Alta has six. They, they, have, they suspend. There are a lot of people at the ski area that are suspended in the air at any given time at a Deer Valley as opposed to an Alta. So uh, there are very different metrics um, and just ways to think about carrying capacity in that regard. And the last thing I'll say is that the resorts are, in my opinion, the best place to, they're the best equipped to um, accommodate great numbers of people. They have the obviously the parking facilities, but they have the bathroom facilities and they have all these uh, things in place to accommodate lots and lots of people. So in terms of where you want people to be in, in the mountains, it's a, it's a great place to put more people. I think I'll just add just one more uh, small element to this. Um, it, uh, first, it's a real challenge to figure out carrying capacity. Any of us who've ever been involved in it technically know how challenging it is for the reasons that, that have been described here, depending on how you want to define it and who you want to define it for. Uh, but one of the remarkable things about this mountain range is that you actually, we actually are able to accommodate those different experiences. And the challenge, maybe the biggest challenge from a recreation point of view going forward, is how do we make sure we maintain that? Um, how do we make sure that someone can find solitude, which is increasingly difficult in these mountains, but 
I know where those places are for me, and I'm not telling anybody. Um, uh, and, uh, but it is increasingly difficult. And if we don't have the proper framework in place in terms of management direction uh, in law, um, that's going to be increasingly difficult, I think, over time. We've had a lot of questions about funding. Um, Dave, you talked early on in your presentation about the, the, the very low level of funding that the Forest Service receives per visitor in, along the Wasatch Front. What are your thoughts to the panel on use fees, particularly in Big and Little Cottonwood Canyon? And the second part of that is if there was a fee system in place, how does that change the demographics of the visitors to the canyons and to the Wasatch Front? Does it change who goes? Does it make those areas less, accept less accessible to economic or other groups? So about a year or so ago, we, we did propose fee areas in the uh, uh, fee sites, I should say, fee areas are against the rule, uh, fee sites in both Big and Little Cottonwood Canyons and some expansions on, on some of our other fee areas. The, the fee areas on the forest have been incredibly successful. And, and that's why we had the, the stories of the different toilet paper because one area had somebody who could be right there? The other one, they had they had to be run around. We didn't we don't have enough personnel to take care of all those areas. As we went through that process, we had comments that were negative and comments that were positive. We sent that up the chain of command to get that approved, and it pretty much got pushed back in, in part because of some of the negative comments. Uh, while, while comments were made yesterday that depending on how you frame these things, certain administrations will, will be more accepting. To be quite honest right now, uh, fees are not popular uh, with this administration. So I think the way we could get some of these things done is if enough people, if enough communities, if, if, if enough organizations were demanding fees and then the Secretary of Agriculture would come to me and say, why aren't you charging fees? Everybody wants them. That would be my perfect world. Um, and, and one of the things we are going to try to do is, is retool our, our public involvement process and really honestly go back out and, and talk to uh, groups and talk to the public and talk to elected officials and, and try to show why those fees would be beneficial. There is no doubt that it does have impacts. Uh, we would still have areas in the canyons where somebody could park and somebody could go hiking. It's not a fee to go on a trail, as was mentioned yesterday. They are amenity fees. We have to provide certain amenities to use those areas. And, and we think as we propose them, they, they would not be an onerous fee. Uh, but it, it certainly does have impacts. Going into American Fork Canyon, where we do have fees, uh, we, we have some of the same issues we have in the Cottonwood Canyons with, with an uh, absolute lot of use. And, and I'm not sure exactly what the demographics are. You've got to take into account Utah County and who, who lives there and who does recreate in these areas. But it, it, there's no doubt it can have an impact. But we want to be able to provide the best quality recreation experience we can, the most sustainable resources that we can for, for recreation that still allow people to be able to recreate out there regardless of who they are, what their economic status is. And, and we've tried to do a lot of research related to that to be able to provide that. I would just want to quickly add, um, as part of that recreation survey, and I should admit that um, the uh, economic uh, demographic of people that took our survey does not align perfectly with our community. Uh, people that are up there recreating frequently tend to have uh, higher incomes for sure. So uh, that's actually a data set we are missing from our uh, recreation survey. But with that, people did say they were willing to um, pay between, I think it was 40 and $60 annually for a pass to kind of enjoy the, the Cottonwood Canyon. So it seemed like there's some support for that, but I do think we need to uh, be sensitive to some of the environmental justice issues. So finding revenues, I mean, uh, that slide is so revealing that 
uh, that Dave showed um, about forest surface and what's happened with budgets, which we know has been true across the board with public land management uh, agencies. And uh, the way it is being uh, handled uh, so far, uh, and not as well as it needs to, is for uh, particularly local and, to a certain extent, state entities coming forward, both with personnel and with funding, to try to fill the gaps. It's also happening from the ski resorts. The ski, Snowbird just adopted the White Pine Trailhead ski area restroom management, right? So we're, we're trying to fill gaps, but long term, uh, the trends in both Republican and Democratic administrations has been a diminishing of revenues for the, our public land management agencies, and particularly in the recreation areas for BLM and the Forest Service at the time that the use is you know, growing exponentially. Um, so the answers, I think, need to be different. Um, part of the Central Wasatch Commission work um, is that um, UDOT received um, a 60 plus million dollar appropriation to deal with Little Cottonwood Canyon traffic issues, uh, traffic congestion issues. They're in the middle of an EIS. As they started on that EIS and got into it, they realized all these ancillary issues directly affect whether or not uh, the, the transportation improvements are going to be successful, the three T's, as, uh, as is popularly referred to here, of transportation, trails, and, and, uh, and toilets. Um, and so they asked the Central Wasatch Commission to step forward and to work with them to wrap around their transportation corridor decision-making, all of the other decisions. Part of that includes how, how are we going to pay for these improvements going forward and how are we going to pay for the use in the canyons. Uh, we're looking at tolling. Uh, tolling has now been authorized in this state through the state legislature with an eye actually towards these canyons. Um, Mill Creek currently has a fee pass program and it makes a huge difference in Mill Creek in the ability to manage uh, that particular uh, canyon. So we know uh, funding is needed. I, my own sense of it is we're going to need to become more and more creative through public-private partnerships, through all the jurisdictions, through um, uh, different kinds of, um, of revenue approaches uh, for managing these public lands. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have to uh, bite the bullet in some cases. And at the same time, I think it is it's just critical that we not be removing accessibility for certain portions of our population that don't have the money to do it. There are ways to do all those things, uh, getting them done. I think it's part of what you're going to see the Central Wasatch Commission focused on in the next really year, year and a half. The only thing I'd add on fees is that the, the ski areas pay the Forest Service um, fees per skier day. Is it per skier day? Yeah, it's along those lines. They they pay the government. Sorry. That yeah. uh, <laughs> it goes into the general fund. It, but there is legislation pending that that would transfer some of that money to the Forest Service. Which is uh, the point I wanted to make. The, our National Ski Areas Association, the association that kind of looks after all the ski areas in the U.S., is put forward um, something called the Ski Fee Retention Act. And what that would do would be to keep some, keep more of uh, a, por a, a larger, much larger portion of the fees that we pay the general fund local. So when Snowbird out to Solitude Brighton and they all pay in, you know, six-figure funds, um, keep those local to be able to help our local forest. I think we have time for one more question. So uh, to all of you, if, if you were king for a day, what are the one or two steps that you would take to looking forward to a future on the Wasatch Front? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I would, I would protect um, every single square inch of, of, of land up in those uh, canyons that has not been developed. Um, I would have a plan in place to help uh, make sure that uh, we connect uh, trails 
um, not not duplicate trails, but connect trails to make make opportunities for um, people to enjoy uh, more of the trails up there um, without too much additional infrastructure that we have no way to take care of and sustain. And um, I would focus our efforts on transportation, not inside the canyons, but how do you get from your home or your hotel to the mouth of the canyons? Um, I think it's less important what goes up and down those, those canyons and more important as to how do we get there without our vehicles. Um, and, and I think we've, um, we've been failing to address that, that, that nuance as we look at transportation and visitation challenges in our canyons. I think a couple of things. One, I would I would want to have a a sustainable recreation system, which is the entire system, well thought out, uh, a well thought out system of trails, of trailheads, of facilities that that is sustainable, something that we can afford to maintain. And then I would also wave my wand and create a better educated public, uh, because as I mentioned, some of you cost more than the others. And, and one of the slides I showed was of graffiti up in the area, and, and things like that take a lot of work. Uh, garbage left behind, people who cut trails, all those kinds of things. Th those kinds of issues take a lot of time and take a lot of energy when we really should be managing uh, the trail systems and the resources and not fixing the damage that's out there. Day. Well, I don't get wands very often um, in any parts of my life, but I guess I would, I think the path actually has been laid out in front of us through the work of Mountain Accord. Uh, and if I could wave a wand, it would be to have those elements implemented. Um, and that really is in two areas. Uh, one of them is to figure out the allocation of these lands for the various recreational uses in a way that protects uh, those uh, various uses um, and uh, and balances them, which I think the Accord uh, did very well, um, and continues with the experiences that we're able to enjoy in these mountains today. Um, and at the same time, uh, to protect the resources, first and foremost, uh, the watershed resources there. I mean, everyone in the West realizes how important water is. Uh, it is uh, actually, I think it's actually just remarkable that we have the quality of water we have coming out of these mountains given the amount of use. Uh, that only happens through really dedicated and sometimes tough management uh, that everyone's agreed uh, to do. Uh, the other, I think, would be to, uh, to figure out the transportation solutions, and I think we've gotten to a certain point. Uh, where we have figured out transportation solutions um, uh, and to do it in a way that's equitable. Uh, there is no question that given how tight a mountain range this is, uh, given the amount of use that we have, given the fact that there are, depending on how you want to count it, uh, uh, six uh, major destination, international destination ski resorts in them, and that we have uh, a valley of well over a million people on one side and a growing probably 50,000 people on the other that's growing, uh, that being able to have a mountain transportation system that works is of enormous value and can reduce the impacts by directing people in places where they can be accommodated more easily for most people the experience they desire at a resort um, and at the same time, uh, protect these mountains uh, so that we don't have people crawling all over every ridge. And uh, I think we have the ability to do that. And if I could wave a wand, uh, not only would that agreement come together in the next little while, but we'd find all of the financing to accomplish it. <laughs> and I know we're wrapping up. Um, you know, my comments really aren't that different than the three previous ones, I'd, I'd really like to come to a resolution. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the ski industry is just, we're not that far away. We're not that far off of, um, you know, what, what Carl or Ralph would like or 
any of the other constituents in the CWC. Um, I, I, for one, am really grateful that there's a Save Our Canyons. We're not sitting on the opposite ends of the table by design. It just happened to be that way. Um, I think it's really, I just, you know, I grew up here. There is a, there's a really important, it's important to have checks and balances. And yeah, we fight all the time. Um, and I would like to, I would like to get to a resolution on that. It'd be really nice if I spent more time promoting skiing than squabbling about whose powder turn goes where. Um, but, you know, people are really passionate about these things, so it's understandable to come to a conclusion, you know, some kind of resolution on a transportation solution to our, our ski product is uh, world class. Our um, lodging and accommodation, whether it's in Salt Lake or Park City or wherever, is world class. Um, the uh, driving from where somebody spent the night to where they're going skiing is third world uh, a lot of times, and it's um, it's tragic. I feel like I'm in you know Mumbai when I'm sitting in the line and traffic in Little Cotton Canyon. But um, so if I could wave my magic wand, it'd be that. And then finally. Um, if I did have that magic wand, I'd, I'd love to have a snow year like we had this year every year because <laughs> it's been really fun. That's if I was king for a day. Thanks. Well, thank you all. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but we're going to take a break now. We'll come back at uh, 1025 for a, uh, a panel discussion confronting the recreation conservation divide. Thank you all. Thank you.